now i request uh, the chairperson of this session professor anvita abbi ji to address the welcome you all uh, i am very happy to see that uh, quite a few of my friends colleagues scholars all over the country as well as from delhi are here <coughs> प्रेसिडेंट साहब ने बहुत ठीक कहा प्राण जाए पर वचन न जाए वाली बात को दोहराया उन्होंने और ये एक बहुत बहुत बड़ी बात है कि क्या है हमारे वचन में जो प्राणों से भी ज़्यादा बड़ी चीज़ है और हम आज के इस सिम्पोजियम में सेकेंड हाफ में दूसरे सत्र में इसकी बात करेंगे कि मिथ्स और टेल्स और नेरेटिव इतनी इम्पॉर्टेंट क्यों हैं कि वो हमारे प्राणों से भी ज़्यादा बड़ी मानी जाती हैं but to begin with uh, i would like to introduce you to the fact uh, which perhaps not most of you know that india represents seven language families they are indo aryan dravidian austro asiatic tibeto burman tai kadai great andamanese and unge jarwa which perhaps belongs to uh, no, we are, it is not been sure but perhaps belongs to austronesian language families so there are seven language families and under each language family there are large hundreds of languages except the languages spoken in the andaman which are not in hundreds however with this kind of multiplicity and diversity obviously the uh, india is has been known all around the globe for its uh, uh, for its richness of languages ethnologue lists 454 languages and according to 2001 census mother tongues in india are 1576 that's a large number of mother tongues now the question is they are people call them dialects or speech forms but as the president of the sahit academy also informed you that each speech form is a language in itself because it's complete in its in the community it is spoken all india radio broadcasts its programs in 146 and newspapers are published in 101 languages however as i said if there are 1576 uh, mother tongues and 454 languages all of them are not written down and there are very few in fact uh, that are written down and our research shows that those languages which are spoken by less than 10000 speakers are not even reported by the census which amounts to more than 156 and largest number of these languages which are spoken by less than 10000 speakers are spoken in jammu and kashmir so these are few glaring facts in front of us which motivate us to study them to research them to bring them in the ambit of uh, the written forms because most of them are unwritten writing in india can be associated with the indus civilization around 4000 years ago However, definite evidence which finds its continuity till today are the Brahmi scripts and the Kharosthi, dating back to roughly 500 BC. The two scripts which finds parallel development. So, India has not only been marked by multilinguality but also by multiscriptality for thousands of years. While Indian scripts developed uh, in, the, in their multiple avatars, I should say. flourishing from hindu kush to the southern regions or from eastern coastal region to the western coastal regions enshrining various speech forms much was left out small speech communities belonging to ancient civilization and traditional societies preserved their speech forms in spoken forms maintaining oral tradition the word of mouth a spoken word in these communities was more than more sacred more intimate and more secular than any written one our spoken world is larger than our written world once udan narayan singh said and i still remember that and it is very true there are more unwritten languages in this country than the written ones if india is to be known for its variety it is these spoken forms uh, which gives its diversity and variety the spoken medium surprisingly has also given these languages languages sustainability over thousands of years and that is what has to be studied that how they have been retained uh, despite the globalization and other economic forces which go against the current 
Conversely, the fear of endangerment that is looming large on our head is also due to the emerging possibility of losing these speech forms in the wake of hegemony of scripted languages. When linguists show their concern over the endangered languages, it is primarily of those which have been spoken for a long period, have been part of a national heritage and a storehouse of environmental and biocultural diversity. The speakers of small and neglected languages. Who are these people? What kinds of civilizations have they preserved? What is it that makes them distinctive from the rest of us? What kind of knowledge system is represented by the oral practices? How can we decipher the history, migration, and cultural behavior of these communities through the myths, tales, and narratives? These are some of the questions, some of the questions actually, that we seek answer to. We are also concerned with the questions of scripting these languages, which were never scripted before. There are several layers of issues and challenges that we have to meet to reach our goal, but we are determined to take them for the sake of posterity and preservation of losing ancient cultural world of India. Widespread language shift that we see today towards major languages in various states will ultimately swallow these small fishes. Hence, the need for scripting them is uh, to be recognized. Many dialects and lexes are shoved under one cover, and we know, and linguists know this, and that reminds me of the latest uh, uh, study had been done on Tangsa, a language spoken in, uh, it's a Tibeto Burman language spoken in the Northeast, which has 70 distinct varieties. Tangsa had 70 distinct varieties, and all of them are not mutually intelligible. Though a script has been devised by Lakhum Mosang of the Naimphai village, and he has devised a script which, en which enshrines the tones also. So these are the kind of uh, efforts that we would like to promote. And uh, I should not forget to mention, when we talk about unwritten languages, the biggest uh, area of sign languages. Sign languages are not written down, they are signed. But we should have also some kind of a documentation of sound la sign languages by the audio, by the voice, sorry, by the visual methods. So these, these are a few challenges that we have in front of us and we have to address in this uh, one-day symposium. To begin with, I'm, uh, I would like to invite Professor Udayanarayan Singh, who has to deliver the keynote address on this topic. Thank you for coming. Thank you, uh, Anvita ji. And I'm very grateful to President and Secretary of Sahit Academy for giving me this opportunity to be able to speak to you today on the 61st birthday of Sahit Academy. My association with Sahit Academy goes back to 1966, and I've been watching so many secretaries and so many presidents working. And this has been always a place for joy for me. The topic of today is Manifesto of the Unwritten World, Curse of Dialects. The important thing is to understand the pain of not being able to write. A lot of authors who write and constantly write know about this pain when you cannot write and only when we know what the written world can achieve, which one cannot do otherwise, do we understand how it feels if we cannot put our thoughts on paper or on wall or on virtual space. Uh, not having one's own feelings, commands or wishes expressed graphically in a material world has no value because as the president said, people now demand that you must give in writing their pranajaya for vachanamajaya. They won't be able to believe if you're only speaking about it. Of course, there's also the world that uh, he mentions there, giving zuban or giving vachan, that world is also there but usually Languages which are not written or the varieties, speech varieties which are not written, which do not have script, people question uh, why should we worry about them at all? 
So that's what I have been uh, worrying, working on and I've been uh, thinking about. Now in this context, I have two slides on, on not being able to paint and on not being able to write. It's a very interesting work by uh, the psychoanalyst Marion Milner who wrote a book on not being able to paint. She worked on children and their educational problems but then she, while working on them, she decided that she would also work on an unresolved problem of her own self. Why is it that as a child she wanted to paint but she was unable to paint? And painting was taking its own course whereas her thought process was going in another direction. Why were they no, not being exactly, you know, being in match with one another? And she says that ultimately she came up with the conclusion that the feelings conveyed by space is what painting is about. And the way we organize our inner world and our outer world within ourselves, within our mind, it depends on that whether you are able to put those walls on paper or not. The basic building block of her drawing she thought was false and overly simplistic and that is why as a creative artist she couldn't paint. Now taking cue from there, Victoria Best from the University of Cambridge wrote another piece called On Not Being Able to Write and this is a dilemma which many authors have and since it's a, it's a whole event about literary festival here, I thought that not only as a linguist but as a, as a creative writer we can mention this, how exactly we feel. She has a blog called Tales from the Reading Room where she says that uh, writing had to do with feelings about our understanding. How do we understand the world and how does the world understand us? These two things are very crucial. So telling of a story will depend on the foundations of these which we cannot avoid. And moods which rise up and trouble us as we paint, it's the similar moods which really sometimes it's a private feeling, sometimes it's a feeling which can be made public. These are the things which actually create problems for us or they encourage us to write. And so it's a more challenging because it's twice removed from reality. If I'm able to speak, if I'm, if I'm to speak about some event or some feelings, it's a direct reflection of my thought process. If I have to write about it, it's like there's a double articulation. It's doubly removed. And that's the reason why writing becomes more difficult, more complicated, and speaking becomes much more easier. Now, we just now heard from the president that basically writing is a technology. Writing allows you to really keep your things, keep your spoken words in print documented. Millennium Oral C perhaps would prompt one to discover ways and means how to keep your spoken words in some kind of a record. Um, oral texts as we all know throughout this period have been sung, recited from memory and performed. Even today Raja Salhes in Maithili or Lorikayan or Chandrayan in uh, Rajasthan, all these are actually sung texts, seven days together you will sing this oral, oral epics. And some of those texts are very complicated in terms of the structure of a narrative but, uh, and also in terms of what exactly they wish to say because they talk about the class struggle, they talk about the uprising of the, of the lowly against the oppressing zamindars. Uh, all these are depicted in the oral epics uh, which we have mentioned here or Naika Banjara for instance. But these are also parallel things which have been happening where nobody cared to write about them. It's only later that we have Manipadma in Maithili writing about it or Vijaydan Detha in Rajasthan writing about it. Otherwise, they have always been for thousands of years remained in our oral tradition. So writing has emerged only as a technology to uh, keep in record whatever was being said. Assuming that writing is only a technique of rendering spoken word, the question is, did the technology come from our own aesthetic inclination towards line drawing and painting? Encyclopedia Britannica says, yes, that's true. Uh, writing appears to have evolved from an extension of picture science. And in such schemes, 
we really directly, iconically represent something or some action. Uh, and then the word that bore that meaning became the symbol for that. Wherever we have extensions of meaning, uh, we had modified that particular thing. And perhaps the Chinese characters or the character writing, you know, the uh, hieroglyphics are the best examples of, of that kind of uh, attempt. So there are no historical records to tell us if writing was a chance discovery of human beings or an answer to man's creative urge. Just as we don't know, we can only make an intelligent guess about that. My conjecture is that this was man's conscious attempt to get rid of the first curse of dialects. What is the first curse of dialects that I mentioned here? The first curse of dialects is rapid fading. Whatever you say in this room, whatever is being said at this point of time in this room, in next one hour, this will fade out completely, this will dis disappear completely. This will not remember, except in, in your memory, or unless, of course, if you keep a record, written record of whatever I've said, whatever anybody has said. So, a rapid fading is the first curse of dialects. And if you want to get out of that, get rid of that curse, then the only way uh, for you would be to write. Because the technology didn't allow us to do anything else earlier. Now, of course, you have the radios, you have recordings of various kinds, you have the online uh, uh, expressions, you have so many other methods of really keeping record of, of the spoken, but not earlier. The second curse of dialects is, I would call, groundedness. Writing came because man's attempt to rid himself from the second curse of groundedness. Earlier, communication was an oral matter. That is, whatever you communicated, it had to be situated in a given space. And you have to be near the person to be able to understand what he's saying. Quite often we would see that a lot of people uh, are gathering around a particular author or a particular scholar, a particular headman of a particular community to be able to have a very clear hearing of what exactly she is saying or he is saying. So groundedness was very important criterion. Now, writing as a technology allowed you to be away from that curse. You do not have to be grounded. Whatever Tulsidas has written at a particular point of time, I don't have Tulsidas around me now, but I'm able to read. So you are not necessarily going to be grounded. So that allows you to get out of that curse. Uh, so in a way, man being a logocentric animal, this was man's discovery of foregrounding the logos, foregrounding the written word. Then the third curse, curse of iconicity, I would say that a written world is such that where there is a precedence of texts, one text precedes the other. There are references, there's a whole chain that builds up. That is, when you're writing today, you cannot write without reference to what has happened earlier. Your references always go, to the, go back. So even if you want to have an epic writing in Kannada, where you want to have Arjuna at the end of the story as the king, rather than Yudhishthir becoming the king in your kind of Mahabharata, still your Kannada Mahabharata has to refer back to the <laughs> earlier Mahabharata uh, in some ways or the other. So therefore, the uh, iconicity uh, factor where writing is derivative, which is why the translation when we are talking about the derivativeness of the translation vis-a-vis -vis the original text, that issue also opens up another whole paradox. So trans, as we know, transliteration, that is whatever we speak, we are talking about the oral epics, how to write them up, how to create a script for that. But this trans that we are talking about, that is taking it across, taking this beyond, taking this through to the other side, go beyond, that derives from Latin. And I think that is a big challenge for any, any of the groups for whenever we are talking about the oral uh, literature. So as iconic expressions, writings have this burden of both hiding and expressing meanings. She opens herself up to numerous interpretations, just as painted images do. Writing at times begin practicing brevity, much less symbols and signs for something that was spoken with so much of eloquence. You know, this is a very important thing. We know uh, Swami Vivekananda basically because of his eloquence. Anybody who has heard him speak would say that whatever he wrote 
in no, no match to what he spoke because that speaking, mesmerizing speaking style of being on a dais and being able to speak is so very different. So therefore, eloquence is a very important thing. And quite often in writing, as you, whatever you spoke, you write in half a page on what you've spoken for two hours. This happens quite often. So therefore, this brevity which comes in writing is a very different kind of category altogether. Whereas spoken world is a very different world. And spoken world, there is no constraint of time. Nobody is in a hurry. Nobody says, I give you only up to 11 o'clock to speak, so you must speak and finish your lecture by 11 o'clock. The spoken world is very different. We are today living in the written world and therefore we have this practice of time-boundedness, brevity, etc., etc. All these are very crucial matters. So speech is minimal and writing elaborates it and that is also what we have seen. The Paninia, uh, you know, Ashtadhyayi, which is full of the sutras, which is full of the uh, brevi uh, brevity, uh, requires so much of tikakaras to be able to expand it fully. And yet, on the tikka, there are further tikkas. So you can see that written world is a very different thing. Uh, it's a very, a very different kind of tradition, whereas in case of spoken world, all we need to do is, if you look at the Javanese Mahabharata, where you have the five Pandavas uh, going around the jungle, so now the jungle doesn't exist, so they're going around the city of Simhapura or Singapore, and then five, one Pandava brother is saying to the other, do you see these tall buildings? What happens there? Why are they so tall? Why are they taller than the trees? And Javanese Mahabharata then starts interpolating a lot of very interesting stories which are to do with today's world uh, into Javanese Mahabharata narration, epic narration. So the narrative epics are very different. They keep changing every time you narrate it to situate it also to make it relevant. Sometimes if they are being used as an election strategy, as a strategy for propagating for a particular candidate, then the, that particular story or epic narrative will include some qualities of the particular person who is standing in the election and so that how you should support him. So there are many reasons, uh, many, many, many reasons and many you know, occasions for them to, to do that kind of interpolation. The curse of historicizing civilization is what I have a slide here about. The speech communities that had discovered writing for themselves are the ones which always attracted historians merely because they present records and evidences and spoken word never cared for evidences. They never cared for maintaining the written record, the records of any kind. So usually in that case, that is the reason why they were dubbed as primitive vernaculars. What happens in the recent time we noticed is that major languages have started acting as killer languages, trying to usurp, grab, put them within themselves and in their belly, all those unwritten languages, which is what exactly we have been, we have heard from the Secretary Sahit Academy that we should really be doing something to, to stop that kind of attrition, language attrition. So the result is that there is a disjoint between what is spoken at home and what is written in formal domains. This reminds us of the legend of Narcissus. Uh, if you remember, the moral of the legend of Narcissus, I don't have to tell you in detail, but I'm sure you know that he was basically in love with himself. All our major written languages are not really concerned about the others, about their neighbors. One doesn't uh, read usually these days what is being written by the neighboring languages. You read only yourself and you are very happy with your own selves, your own debates, your own gossips, your own problems and your own, you know, uh, fights and quarrels. So the problem is that they're almost like the narcissist situation where she, he drives away the eco who has fallen in love with narcissist until one day we have nemesis who comes and realizes that this chap must look at himself to be able to realize what he is like. And only when he realizes in the, in the water reflection himself that he dies, disappears. So that's exactly what's happening. So the looking within yourself, not across, not beyond, not using the word trans, translation, transliteration is what's going to kill you actually, ultimately. It's a very problematic thing for major written languages also. So there is a lesson for the written languages as well to be able to understand that.
And I think here I would like to remind you of what Tagore had said about civilization. Um, he says that all of us have really started building walls around ourselves. We have actually uh, seen that the civilization of ancient Greece was nurtured within city walls. In fact, I am quoting from Tagore, in fact all the modern civilizations have their cradles of brick and mortar. These walls leave their mark deep in the minds of men. They set up a principle of divide and rule in our mental outlook which begets us a habit of securing all our conquests by fortifying them and separating them from one another. Therefore, we divide nation and nation, knowledge and knowledge, man and nature. He says this in his very interesting work on series of lectures he delivered in the USA called Sadhana. And I think this is very crucial for us to understand that the manifesto of an unwritten civilization should be very different from the manifesto of the written civilizations that we have been talking about so far. And you know, the manifesto as it, as it started being used, one of the most important use of the expression of manifesto was the expression when you have poet Filippo Thomas Marinetti in Italy talked about the Futurist Manifesto, where at the turn of century, he advocates rejection of the past to bring in modernization and cultural rejuvenation. Because he thinks that the most important thing that will happen in the future is the speed, is the machinery, is the violence, is the usefulness and the industry. These five elements will dictate to you how exactly your future will be shaped. And therefore, he talked about the Futurist Manifesto. Now, we know about the Bhadralok writing, Bhadralok poetry in Bengali. We have talked about in our earlier essays, uh, Adho Adho Bhav and Gadho Gadho Bhav. The people have been writing insipid poetry basically in that particular manner. And it's only when you have a group of people who have completely divorced from that tradition, somebody uh, led by Michael Madhusudan that, or somebody led by uh, Dirozio, that you have a great poetry in Bengal which started appearing at one particular point of time. So that is uh, one thing which I just wanted to mention about the Futurist Manifesto. The Futurist Manifesto has said lots of things about this speed and violence at a point of time when he didn't even know that there's going to be a Russian revolution, there's going to be two world wars, etc., etc. So it's a very interesting thing how exactly poets can foresee the things that are going to happen in the next few, uh, next few decades. And Unfortunately, it also usualized the hygienic properties of war and violence. So that is one problem with that Futurist Manifesto because the poet concerned had also you know, encouraged or supported or showed why violence becomes very important. Uh, would the new manifesto of the unwritten literary expressions like to create new genres and narratives? This is one question I've been, I thought I will throw it to the uh, audience and let us ruminate on that. Can we think that if we are going to encourage this unwritten world, in their manifesto, new genres will emerge, new expression styles will emerge, rather than the typical genres which have been fossilized so far in the written world? Uh, shall the unwritten languages give primacy to speaking or emitting meaningful noises at their creativity? Or their creativity must have to do with the deployment and manipulation of noises and performances accompanying them. What could we say about this kind of noises? This is, art of noises is something which a lot of people have been worrying about at one particular point of time. Um, immediately after Futurist Manifesto, we had Luigi Russolo, who brings out uh, an, a treatise on art of noises and says that our ears are so accustomed to the speed, energy, and noise of typical urban industrial soundscape that we are now unable to understand, or unable to hear many other kinds of noises, which are beautiful noises, which uh, we, uh, are, are noises often are part of spoken languages. Uh, in order to stir our sensibility, uh, today's creators, therefore, what do they need to do? Today's musicians, they need to create something like a complicated polyphony, make it more noisy. Uh, more complicated polyphonic noises to be able to attract. And that is why if you look at the tradition of music that has happened between 1901 
1910, at that point of time when this was, the streetized was coming, and 1960, 70, all those 50, 60 years, there have been more and more greater and greater noises which have become music, which have become part of the music. But the question is, uh, is this enough? Will our oral uh, epics, oral languages be restricted to that? Uh, what would our futurist musicians do? Substitute for the limited variety of timbers that orchestra possesses today for the infinite variety of timbers in noises because in phonetics and linguistics, one thing which has been told but to us by Henry Swift to uh, Daniel Jones to everybody that between here from where the uh, noise begins and here where the noise ends, there, is a, there are infinite spots where and infinite ways of manipulating this noise, entire noise production. Therefore, actually, number of sound, speech sounds that we use in oral languages today, there are much more greater number of sounds that we can actually be capable of emitting. So are we thinking of a new kind of music, new kind of poetry with that kind of noise? This is one question which I have in my mind. I think the six families of noises, we should watch out for oral literature. And I have just given you a new generation of soundscape with giving you those six points. I will just mention, read them up. One is the family of roars, uproars and outcry. I, won't, I don't think you should be surprised to see this because if you look at the music today, many music, many, many, many new kind of records which are coming from uh, many African languages, languages, uh, many African traditions where they are mixing that tradition with the, their way of speak, singing in English, their way of bringing their own style of singing into our own uh, soundscape, you can hear that, roars, uproars and outcry, noise of surroundings and thunderings, plosions including explosions, banging, clanging and rattling. The percussions that we use these days, uh, we have got very sophisticated tabla and dholak and other kind of percussion instruments, but I'm sure you will notice that these days more and more newer kind of percussions have started appearing. Uh, so booms, bursts and blasts as captured by human voices. Second is whistling and hissing. Whirling, we have actually been imitating from the oral culture. Whisper, sighing, murmuring, humming, rumbling, mumbling, muttering, gurgling, chuckling and cackling. Screeching and creaking, rustling, buzzing. The noises emitted when one beats on metals, wood, skin, stones, pottery. Voices of animals of various kinds, shrieks, wails, hoots. All these uh, will become part of the oral narrative, oral epic of the unwritten world. There are infinite possibilities basically that I mentioned here. Future creators should strive to replicate these infinite timbers in noises as they compose newer kinds of entities which defy our traditional categorization. As these noises are infinite, so is man's creative ability. So therefore, I think the world of oral sea is, is waiting to be discovered. Thank you very much.